Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 105, The Knowledge Economy. This is the first in a trilogy. Yes, we've got another trilogy, a trilogy of vlogs that's going to explore how your PhD can travel. So in the vlog today, we're yes, looking at the knowledge economy. We're going to put in some definitions of the knowledge economy, its strengths and its weaknesses, and also its capacity to frame, enable and transform your your PhD and particularly your post PhD future. Okay, so what is the knowledge economy? It is a social and an economic system that values and evaluates the tangible and intangible outcomes of knowledge. Boom. So just think about it as a social and an economic system that deals with the outcomes of knowledge. That's the easy definition. Now, many of these outcomes have economic value, and that's very important to this area, but they also have a social value. The knowledge economy is aligned these days and framed by and with digitization and globalization. And so those three terms, think of them as like three circles that come together, the knowledge economy, digitization and globalization. So basically it involves understanding the human capacity of and for intelligence, linking it with machine work and creating new and innovative economic strategies, looking at what happens when humans and machines get together. But the knowledge economy is also possible without technology, particularly digital technology, but since the uh, Read Write Web, since Web 2, so that's 1999 to 2001, the knowledge economy has been particularly sucked into understanding interactive digitization and the capacity of social media as well. But the term has a much longer heritage than that. The earliest reference I found to the knowledge economy, and please correct me, but the earliest reference I found was from 1969, Peter Drucker in his book, The Age of Discontinuity. So 1969, but it was also derived from a much wider and deeper concept that goes right back actually to the 19th century that links with the notion of scientific management. So the knowledge economy, although appearing a bit new and a bit edgy and a bit sexy has quite an interesting and long-term history and trajectory. Now at this point of the vlog I'm going to present this argument relatively neutrally but can I say I radically disagree with the argument about to present but so we'll just caveat that for a second but let me talk about what a lot of the theorists particularly these early theorists of the knowledge economy meant by the phrase. So the knowledge economy is configured within a linear mode of development. So it starts with agricultural based economics, moves through the industrial modeling of economics, and then through to the knowledge economy. So revolutions in food, revolutions in labor, and revolutions in knowledge. Now, of course, I think this linear development model is absolute nonsense. Prog progress is an ideology, is a flawed ideology. So the very nature that we're now in this incredibly complex economy, but the agricultural revolution wasn't quite significant, or the industrial revolution wasn't quite significant, or that food and industrialization are somehow gone, and it's in the past, and now we're all modern and new with knowledge, that's absolute nonsense. And I've spent a lot of my life thinking about how the knowledge economy operates in and through food and food production. So start to critique that linear modeling of progress and modernity. So food and labor and knowledge are bouncing around each other like a pinball wizard. It's not a linear development. Okay, so at this point, I really want to express my key caveat here. So the three terms we're going to be looking at in this trilogy of vlogs are the knowledge economy, creative industries, and the fourth industrial revolution. All very important phrases. You need to know what they mean. You need to know how they operate in and around your research and your career, yes. But the problem is the bulk of the people who research and use these terms are evangelical. So they're what I call, and I've used this phrase in vlogs in the past, they're believe and achievers. You know the people that wear a nice shiny polyester suit and then walk that suit around sort of making money out of talking about these phrases without a lot of content. So just remember when these phrases are used like the knowledge economy, 
evangelical commitment often comes with it. So it's one-eyed analysis and they're not presenting the problems with this model as well. And I'm presenting both today. So do remember that these phrases that I'm talking about have key concepts and ideas and they are useful. But also be aware that some people when they're using these phrases, it's almost like a religious fixation for them. So avoid that sort of stuff. Now, I think a lot of that evangelical commitment, you know, has a, comes from a good place. The notion that knowledge is an innovative force in the culture, so it creates innovation. But my problem is that's reifying and simplifying and in some ways erasing the very complicated and intricate history of the industrial economy and the industrial revolution. So it's this notion of right, well, right now we're in the knowledge economy, we've got brand new rules, brand new behaviours and everything that existed in the industrial age and through manufacturing, that's gone because now it's new times. Well, that is absolute nonsense. It rewrites history in a really unfortunate way. And it assumes that all innovation has come from digitization, that all innovation magically arrived with the internet. And before the internet, look, really nothing interesting happened. And for me, that's absolute nonsense. I spent a lot of time looking at the innovations from the industrial age in particular. And I think about, say, the flying shuttle from textile mills in 1733, or the spinning jenny that was invented in, let's see how my memory goes, 1764. You know, these were incredible innovations that transformed the world and had nothing to do with digitization was part of the knowledge economy I would argue but they wouldn't have been using that phrase then so just remember innovation exists everywhere through history it's not reliant on the internet okay so why I think the knowledge economy is useful to you as PhD students is it crystallizes something that's really important because the knowledge economy shows that education is an asset, education is productive, and education can enable economic development. Now in anti-intellectual times, just actually committing to the value of knowledge, I think is quite a powerful rhetorical moment. Now, once more, I think my critique is clear on this. Yes, education has economic value, and it is important that we talk about that but it also has profound social value as well. So we've just got to make sure in our greed is good times, greed is everywhere, that we also remember that education has a profound social value as well that may not be quantifiable. So let's get into this. The characteristics of the knowledge economy that we're dealing with in this current manifestation, particularly framed by digitization and globalization. So the characteristics of the knowledge economy are one, speed, so speed of change, what's often called an accelerated culture. There's also a movement away from natural resources towards intellectual resources. A movement from working with your hands to working with your head. A specialised labour force that is also computer literate. So a specialised labour force rather than a generic labour force, important. And this is a significant one, the capacity to find connections between disparate industries for economic gain. So in the creative industries gig that we're doing next week, I'm particularly focusing on what I have termed the horizontal integration of the industries. So the knowledge economy is about linking together industries that when you do that linkage, then suddenly more money and more profit is available through the innovation and the ideas. Now, there's lots of predictions about the next stage after the knowledge economy uh, and the network economy is seen to be the big one so that's like local ideas are then moved throughout the world via digitization i'm sorry i don't see that as any different at all from the knowledge economy so you get all sorts of weird derivatives oh like the knowledge economy is over we're moving on uh, my other bizarre phrase that seemed to be the next stage is the passion based economy who are these people, really? Who are they? Okay, so what, <laughs> what makes the knowledge economy innovative and why I do like to use it, I do use it a lot and I do believe in it and I think it has value, is because I think it tempers and it frames those other two big words, globalization and digitization. I think a lot of the theorization of globalization and digitization in the last 20 years has been pretty poor and pretty naive. 
But when those two terms are framed within the knowledge economy, I think they dance a little bit more elegantly. And I think what digitisation, globalisation, the knowledge economy together demonstrate is we've moved beyond the economy of scarcity. And I'll explain what that means. So in our previous manif manifestations through the 20th and indeed the 19th century, the focus was on a culture of scarcity, digging resources out of the ground and selling them. And of course, those resources run out, peak oil 101. So that's a culture of scarcity. But the knowledge economy moves us to a culture of abundance so that new ideas are always emerging and when they're shared, when they're clustered, they create new ideas. So that's a culture of abundance. Also, the knowledge economy critiques the nation state and nationalism because it requires a new and innovative understanding of patents and IP. So the nation state is not the effective way in which we deal with the knowledge economy because it's about movement, movement of ideas, movement of people, movement of money. But I think why I do love the knowledge economy as a phrase, and I do use it, is because it is a recognition at its most basic that intelligent people matter and intelligent people are productive on this planet. And look, so much of my life, when I do sort of seminars these days or I'm talking with people, is they use phrases like, oh, it's all about technology, or then once they've exhausted the discussion about technology, they go, oh, it's all about leadership. And actually, you know what? It's not all about technology. It's not all about leadership. It's about ideas. Ideas matter. Intelligent people matter. That's why academia matters. So the knowledge economy is creating a new way of thinking about consumption and production. It's based on intellectual capital and human intelligence as an asset. Now, the World Bank a really interesting organisation in itself, is quite fixated on the knowledge economy, and they have been for quite a while. And they configure it via four pillars, four pillars. And they define it via institutional structures that provide incentives for entrepreneurship. So that's the first pillar. Second one, interesting, a skilled labour availability and good education systems. Two, three, ICT, who's still using ICTs? Well, the World Bank is ICT infrastructure and access. So good tech, good tech that allows stuff to move, yeah? And the fourth pillar, a vibrant innovation landscape, including academia, the private sector, and civil society. Right, now that's fantastic, isn't it? Because two of those four pillars involve universities and involve universities training clever people. It's also a recognition, I think, that academia has value, and I think we need to really hold on to that idea. In anti-intellectual times, I do believe the knowledge economy has rhetorical value. So, you know, for the people who say, look, I don't like clever people, I don't like experts, well, good luck with that, girlfriend. Really enjoy yourself, knock yourself out. So in a PhD program, this affirmation of the importance of intelligent people matters. And all of us used to get that question, you guys still do probably, you know, why are you doing a PhD? Why, why, why are you doing a PhD? And the obvious answer is, I'm really intelligent and I want to work at the edge of knowledge and I want to create something new. That's the answer for why you do a PhD. And you simply can't have a knowledge economy without PhD students with their highly trained mind their knowledge absolutely at the cutting edge of expertise, go out and populate and enable a whole series of new industries. Fantastic. So the knowledge economy and PhD students go together really like Morecambe and Wise. The task therefore for all of us involved in education is to ask really what is the point of a university in this new environment? What are we meant to be doing here? And I think the great difficulty for complex economic environments like Australia where the relationship between the agricultural revolution, the manufacturing sector and the tertiary sector is quite complex and involved. The key problem is how to manage fluctuations in the labour market. So how do you ensure you have enough workers for the busy times but also you're not paying them during the quiet times so you're able to make a profit. 
That's the great challenge of the post-industrial age. And of course, the answer to that question is you have an enormous casual workforce that provides flexible labour solutions. Now, in higher education, we see that through the large number of casual staff we have teaching our students, the adjunct workforce, as they refer to it in North America, and short contract academic posts. So the characteristic of the knowledge economy is actually based on an area I do a lot of research on, which I've referred to as the post-work environment. So the knowledge economy is based on a post-work environment. And what are the characteristics of a post-work environment? Well, a casualised labour force, a fair amount of free time that's available, therefore, and also the proliferation of technology. So to make a living now involves a large group of our population holding a large number of jobs. So you're not simply doing one job for a long term, long time. You've got a portfolio career. You're doing multiple jobs to make a living. Also, it means we must accept a relatively permanent level of underemployment. So we always know that there will be a group of citizens through their career who will be underemployed. So the knowledge economy has meant that tertiary education is incredibly important to this new post-work labour force because it means that employers can expect a highly credentialed and qualified workforce to be available at any time. They don't have to train their workers. You guys are arriving at an interview with a PhD. <laughs> so again, a university is fantastic for employers because we're training you up and they don't have to pay for it. And of course, in a casual workforce, they can simply hire you and you can hit the ground running and you can start. Now, governments also love this highly qualified workforce because for the young guys and gals, it keeps them out of the unemployment figures for a period of time while they're doing a degree. So you can see what's going on here. So the knowledge economy matters. It matters economically, it matters socially, but it also has that rhetorical power that knowledge is the engine for productivity and for growth. But it also means that more is expected of workers, and that's incredibly important. You have to be well educated and you have to stay at the cutting edge of where knowledge is at through professional development. So you're going to be incredibly well educated, you're going to be operating at the edge of knowledge, but you're also going to be battling for full-time and permanent work. See the paradox? Because the innovations and the profit is based on this casualised, contracted workforce. So the final thought that I'll leave you with, that really is the meta lesson of the knowledge economy, is that our current culture, I would argue, is no longer about know-how. It's about know-why know why. So in your PhD, when you're working through your PhD, yes, the what matters, the knowledge. Yes, the how matters, the methods. But the why perhaps matters most of all, the epistemology and the ontology. And that will enable you to connect your knowledge, your expertise, the way in which you're doing your PhD to the wider knowledge generation of our society. And that is the knowledge economy. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.